Good evening. Can everybody hear me? In the back? Very good. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, we're so glad you could join us here this evening. My name is Eric Stanley. I'm the Associate Director and Curator of History at the Museums of Sonoma County. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> the microphone over to our moderator tonight, uh, to, to Gayla Barron, who is, I don't know that she needs introduction, but <laughs> um, the, she's a columnist, author, and teacher, and of course, a local historian who's written thousands of columns. Um, and I might add, she's been an important voice in the aftermath of the fires, having contributed articles to the Washington Post. And she's been a, a longtime collaborator, collaborator and source of inspiration uh, for the museum. So I'm very pleased to hand this over to Gayla Barron. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Who knew that somebody named Eric Stanley had a grandfather named Francois? You know, this, <laughs> America's, a, a, America's a wonderful country. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce our panel, but I'm not going to let them talk until I get through introducing all of them. Uh, <clears throat> Bo Simons. Raise your hand, Bo. Ah, this is Bo. Bo retired in, in 2015 after 37 years as a librarian, 32 of which were with the Sonoma County Library. And he was the first wine librarian with the Sonoma County Wine Library in Healdsburg, uh, and the first internet librarian, and as branch manager of Healdsburg Librarian. And a library, I'm sorry. And since retiring, Bo is he retiring. You retired like I retired. Yeah, I know. Uh, has has produced a series of literary programs called Luminarius, featuring novelists, poets, and historians at Shed in Healdsburg. And he's <coughs> excuse me currently working on a book about the history of wine in Sonoma County, which is why he is here tonight. Um, Barbara Ganella. Barbara, thank you for all of this. This is an amazing spread we've got here. <clears throat> Barbara has, has literally rolled up her sleeves and imprinted her brand on this historic Occidental Hotel. Uh, her Italian heritage may account for her love of, of creating beautiful, abundant farm table dinners in a convivial atmosphere that speaks of very old world customs. Uh, she holds her BA, BA from the uh, Sonoma State University, her degree in education from Dominican, and is still educating generations of faithful local and Bay Area customers who make regular pilgrimages to Occidental uh, and, with this, and uh, along with a new wave of tourists who find that the quintessential food town in the West County is a place to visit. And I might just say that when I first went to work at the Press Democrat, there was a man named Mike Pardee who wrote about little towns in Sonoma County. He had a, a Sunday piece called Howdy that went around and said, Howdy Middletown, Howdy. Um, and when he said Howdy Occidental, he said that there was a rumor. Now, this is back in the 40s, I think, probably, or 50s. There was a rumor that there was a whole pool of marinara sauce under Occidental, that, the three, that the, the three Italian restaurants here, because there was Fiori's, Negri's, and the Union, and uh, that they all drew from the same pool. But that's not true, I mean, no. Anyway, Barbara, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Jennifer Bice, Jennifer, Jennifer, goodness sakes. Jennifer once named a goat after my husband, two goats, one after John and one after me. I still remember that. They were cute little devils, they really were. Jennifer is the oldest of 10 siblings who, as I remember, seemed to come directly out of 4-H and into the business world, and I think you pretty much did, when she took over her parents' goat farm in 1978. And her interest in dairy goats and in artisanal foods brought her brought her Redwood Empire, Red, I'm sorry, Redwood Hill Farm and Creamery into the forefront of the marketplace at a time that was just, just right. Your timing, I, you, you know, you came to the industry at a time when, when goat dairy products were still considered experimental, really. 
and uh, she's been a leader for quality and innovation and still maintaining that important principles about nature and the and the, the environment and animals and how they serve us and how they should be regarded. And she's at the forefront of one of the most important changes in Sonoma County agriculture and I don't know whether her timing was good or whether she planned it that way. But Jennifer, we're glad to have you. Jonah, Jonah Raskin is a member of Slow Food, Russian River and the author of a book called Field Days, A Year of Farming, Eating and Drinking Wine in California. What a way to go. Mm -hmm. He writes about food and farming for the Slow Food blog and, blog and for the Huntington Post. He was born and raised in New York. He has lived in Sonoma County since 1975 and taught at Sonoma State University for 30 years. He serves on the history committee of the Sonoma County Museum. And last but not least, my colleague down there at the other end, Diane Peterson, writes about food and wine classical music and the arts. So, I mean, we're a, we're a short staff these days. And everybody does a lot uh, for the Press Democrat and for Sonoma Magazine. And she grew up in Philadelphia, but she considers herself a transplanted New Englander because both her, her parents and her grandparents were born in Boston. Uh, and after she got her BA in comparative literature from Brown University and an MJ in journalism from UC Berkeley, Go Bears. She, report, she started her reporting career uh, in 1982 in Sonoma County. She joined the Press Democrat in 1984, where she also met her husband, Chris Smith, columnist, who's lurking somewhere in here. Um, and they have a son, Max, 27, who's studying to become a physical therapist. Diane grew up eating lobster, steamed clams, and chowder by the chilly Atlantic. She's along with Boston baked beans, brown bread, and hot dogs. Do you have, I'm not even going to ask you if you miss all that. But she achieved a successful transition to what we now know as wine country cuisine. And we welcome Diane as well. Um, yeah, you can clap. That's, that's the end of it. Before I, before I start down the row here from Bo forward and, and ask them to, to give a little five minute presentation of, of what, they're, what they're about, uh, I want to take a, a moment of personal privilege and talk a, just briefly about what, what the drinking and dining situation was when I came to Santa Rosa in the 1950s because it was so different that if you weren't here, you would never believe it. Uh, Italian Swiss Colony was, was the, the, the largest winery in California at that time and sort of the center of, of wine here. It was, was you know, as, as we have since termed it, it, largely a jug wine, a jug wine county. Uh, my colleague at the Press Democrat then, a, a real character named Bob, Bob Wells, used to say that uh, jug wine, the definition of jug wine was what you drank behind a billboard. So I, I, I offer you that as well. Uh, the, uh, I, the wineries that I remember uh, in my early years of patron patronizing wineries were Martini and Prati, where you could go and take a jug and they would fill it. And there are still wineries where you can do that. Sebastiani, August Sebastiani, Lou Fopiano, the Pedrincellis, and of course the Segatios. And uh, maybe it was the Segatios, I'm not sure. There was one winery I remember that made some very good old vine zin that came from a hillside, and it was called Jackass Zin because the family thought that only a jackass would go up there and plow those, uh, to, to cultivate those, those grapes on the side hill. Uh, the food, in food, the, the Italian connection was definitely here in the 1950s. Uh, not only here, but the Swiss Hotel in the El Dorado in Sonoma, Danucci's in Valley Ford, uh, Freddie Annie's on the highway, where Mom's apple pie is between Forestville and Sebastopol, and uh, uh, of course in Occidental on the pool of marinara sauce, the, the, three, the three restaurants. Uh, and Santa Rosa, Lima's side by side in Gadotti's Toscano Hotel, where Stark's, Stark's Steakhouse is now. And those who chose to eat American in Santa Rosa, it was basically Eisenhoods on the square next to the Empire Building, 
uh, and that's where the Rotary Club and then all the other service clubs, in fact, in, in town met upstairs. And on the other side of the square, the Topaz Room, which was so fancy that during the World War II, it was off limits to enlisted men. And that's pretty fancy. And in the 50s, Cotting, of course, built Montgomery Village and brought us the saddle and sirloin, which was a whole new look. And Clyde Chesney. Uh, anything more exotic, like pizza, or uh, pizza, seriously, pizza. The first pizza, in, there were, were no pizza places here in the 50s. The first one was probably the very late 50s, maybe early 60s. And it was in Mirabelle, of all places, right where the road comes in, to, where the road from, from Forestville comes into River Road. Before, and it was, you know, be, you had to go to San Francisco if you wanted food other than Italian or, or American. You went for, uh, there was some, not even a Mexican, there was one Mexican restaurant late in the 50s, and that was all in Sonoma County. Uh, and uh, you, you simply went down for, for uh, you had to go all the way to the city to hear live music and to eat foreign food, and it was that kind of, of um, cultural or, I guess, culinary desert at that point. Uh, and that was pretty much the way it was until a guy named John Ash opened the Courthouse Cafe on 4th Street and everything began to change. So let's talk about where we started, which is with wine, and uh, how we became wine country. Bo, you want to do that for us? OK. Good evening. Uh, why does man kill? He kills for food. Not only food, frequently there must be a beverage. Woody Allen said that, and it's certainly true that the wine and food revolution that happened in this <clears throat> county and California and the United States has been a partnership between wine and food. I'm just going to stick to the wine part. And what happened in Sonoma County after World War II <clears throat> was that it continued uh, to, to, the, to the wine industry here was that it continued to decline and fall for about 20 years uh, after, with a combination of factors, when a combination of factors called the wine revolution in the late 60s and 70s and about a half century after that of consolidation, continuation. That phrase, the wine revolution, I think was first coined by Leon Adams, who wrote The Wines of America, came out in several editions, and was one of the great promoters and historians of that revolution. And my thesis is that it takes great wine to make a revolution, and we needed to relearn how to make great wine. It also takes a certain amount of affluence to, to have the leisure to, to go after that and be dissatisfied with the kind of cuisine we had. And, but the third factor is the Leon Adams, Millie Howie factor, which is PR. It needs marketing. It, and, uh, <clears throat> but first, let's go for some numbers. In 1946, there were about 22,000 acres of wine grapes in Sonoma County, down a little bit from right after Prohibition. Grape acreage went up during Prohibition. By 1951, it was down to 14,000. It bottomed out at 10,000 in uh, 1962. The wine revolution comes 35,000 by 1980. 2016, it's up to 60,000. So you can see it, it kept dipping. And it's hard for us to imagine how Gay alluded to it, that what the California wine scene was like at the close of World War II. California and the Sonoma County wine industry had come out of prohibition with high hopes, but prolonged depression and other factors uh, made us stumble through the 30s, 40s, and 50s until in much of the 60s before the level of production and new quality entered back into it. In these hard, unlovely times, most Californian wines were sweetened and fortified. And uh, <clears throat> the, those Cal Sonoma County wineries, Gay named a few, the, the, the ones that, that came to my mind as I was sitting down here was Simi, Italian Swiss Colony, Fopiano, Sebastiani, Fountain Grove, Corbel, Nervo, Pastori, Martini and Prati, Pagani, Gundlach Bunshu, Buena Vista, Pedrincelli, and the list goes on. You see there's a lot of vowels at the end of the names. The uh, <coughs> wine sales took a 
little uptick during World War II because there was no wine coming from Europe. And uh, they, they, there was, a, and here again, the, the, the PR factor came in. A man named Frank Schoonmacher, a German wine importer and New Yorker author, wrote a book with a guy named Tom Marvell called American Wine in 1941 and touted Sonoma County wines for the first time since Prohibition and looked at them in a serious way. And he was not only looking at Italian Swiss colony, he was going out to the other small producers around there and finding good stuff. And, uh, but let's get to the science that, that needed to be relearned. And uh, post-World War II, California, Sonoma County wines were still in the shadow of prohibition. And uh, I was reading an oral history by a guy named Bradford Webb, who uh, was the enologist, the winemaker for uh, Hansel later on, but, but immediately he graduated from Cal right after the war and worked for Julius Fessler at the uh, yeast lab in Berkeley. And, uh, but he, and he talks about, well, I'll just let Brad talk. When prohibition was repealed, the first couple of vintages were failures. Everybody conceded that they had forgotten how to make wine. The individuals at Food Technology, that's the Berkeley lab, and what later became Viticulture and Enology at Davis felt that the wild yeasts had taken over the vineyards, that they had, and wine had been mostly made during prohibition in uh, <clears throat> New Jersey or Chicago or Philadelphia or other places where the wine was shipped and there was no wine made near the vineyards anymore and the yeasts had no chance to get back into the vineyard to recycle the way they do in an ordinary viticulture area. The yeast spend the winter as spores in the vineyard, then get back on the surface of the grapes and are carried to the winery on the grapes, then back to the vineyard. It's an ecological cycle. They hypothesized that this cycle was broken during prohibition and what was needed was a technique of using pure cultured yeast. Now they used cultured yeast for, for a long time. Pasteur came up with it in the 1870s. And, uh, and it was used, but it wasn't that widespread. So they come back out of prohibition when everybody was, was making home wine or natural yeast and, and they had to relearn. I mean, to me that, that, that speaks about not only the broken market pipeline, but, but the basic science that needed to be redone. Uh, Second factor is the good life and the overcoming the big is good emphasis on wine and the terrible palate of most Americans and discovering the good life. And I think Americans in the post-war years love the convenience, the predictability and mass produced food, uh, TV dinners and, and all of that. In wine, it was, they still had that sweet fortified wine that, and, and Gallo had rocket scientists that were doing things like Spagnata and Bali High and, <laughs> and those other things. But uh, the, what, what, what happened to change that? What, what made it small and beautiful? I think it took prosperity, the cumulative prosperity of the 50s produced the seeds of the wine revolution and that people said, is this all there is? Is this food and wine, all there is. And some people looked at the wine lifestyle as, as something that they could break out of the corporate world or academia or other places. And, uh, and there were a number of people who loved good wine, really great wine, and thought they would go back to the land. It's, there were a few of these refugees more in Napa, but, but by the, uh, <clears throat> by the fifth, in 52, uh, a man wasn't quite a refugee. He was, he was uh, <clears throat> James Zellerbach, who uh, bought some acreage above the town of Sonoma and started the Hansel Winery. He hired Brad Webb, the man we were, I quoted a little bit earlier, to be his winemaker. He hired a guy named Ivan Schock, who's a vineyard manager from the Napa area and who also helped you know, for, for 20 years, if you wanted to, if you had a zillion bucks and wanted to be a wine person, you hired Ivan Schock to put in your vineyard. And, uh, and he wanted to cre create the Clover Joe experience, do really good Burgundies and uh, Pinots and Chardonnays. And by 1956, he was making them. And, uh, and following him, 
were, were, were other ones, but before him in the town of Sonoma, uh, <clears throat> it was a UPI uh, guy, uh, Frank Bartholomew, who uh, nicknamed Bart, who, who uh, he was on vacation in 1943, not vacation, leave, furlough, from uh, keeping a group of, of, managing a group of UPI uh, war correspondents and had lunch with a friend in Glen Ellen who casually remarked that there was a ranch for sale by the state of California. And uh, Bart went down and looked at the ranch and, uh, and they, they entered a bid for it and bought 500 acres for $17,600. And uh, he didn't even know it at the time, but it was the remains of the Harasti Buena Vista ranch. And, uh, and his wife had to do, re he went back to war, his wife was starting to renovate the ranch. The vines had all been lost to phylloxera. They, they were, they started replanting and he started trying to make quality wine and because he was a newspaper man, piping the wine. So you, you've got that connection. The others who escaped into the, uh, the Sonoma Hills and stuff, there, there are a lot of them. Uh, <clears throat> Russ and B.J. Green, Russ was an oil man from the Los Angeles area who grew up in San Francisco and vacationed in Camp Rose near Healdsburg and, uh, and remembered that while he's down at his desk in, in Los Angeles and, uh, and saw an ad in the Wall Street Journal for some property and adjoining the Russian River in Alexander Valley, bought that, brought his friend Harry Wetzel up. They, st you know, they, Russ later bought Simi Winery uh, Harry started Alexander Valley Vineyards. Uh, Davis Bynum left journalism, started an urban winery in Albany before buying property on West Side Road and helping pioneer Calif Sonoma County Pino. Dave Stair, an engineer out of MIT, came, came and opened the first new winery in Dry Creek in 71. Joe Swan, an airline pilot and wine lover, bought a vineyard and land near Forestville and set about making incredible Zinfandels and Pinots in the 70s. About the same time, Rodney Strong, a former dancer and now owning a liquor store in Tiburon, bought some land on Old Redwood Highway. <clears throat> the list goes on. I could, I could go, I'm, I'm, I don't wanna hog the whole evening, but, but that, that good life that these guys had, these guys were the precursors, and the big boys kinda took notice from them and started making better wine. You'll notice that Gallo now, uh, has a big stake in, in fine wines and isn't just taking front Central Valley fruit. They've, they've always appreciated Sonoma County wines and, uh, and, and they've done that. Uh, the, all of this, the, this, this change in, in wine, the, the, the technical advances that were made and the other things would have and the small producers that were out there producing these, these, these lovely wines in small quantities, I think it would, would have been less of a bubble if it weren't for the, for the marketers, the dedicated men and women who push the product in journalism, advertising, winery events, such as we're at tonight kind of thing, food events, and stunts. Stunts like the Paris tasting of 1976. <clears throat> They helped create the buzz and sizzle of California wine, and it is a lot of it is both buzz and sizzle. They also help maintain the record. Some of the best marketeers are the big guys, and there's a direct chain to the tireless promoters like Harasti in the in the 1800s and Mondavi in the 1960s and 70s. Guys who are breathtaking in their audacity. And ability, though tireless, their tireless lobbying, promoting, going to county fairs, going to the legislature, that that kind of stuff helps. It helped Harasti change the locus of the California wine industry from the Los Angeles area to Northern California in the 1860s, and it helped Mondavi a century later change the whole focus of wine in the world from. Europe to California. Thank you. Yeah.
Good job. I remember uh, interviewing uh, uh, old Louis Martini in 1970 and asked him, what, who, and Louis Martini at that time was known for making, this is in Napa, making the, probably the best, the best Cabernet that was made in California. And I asked him who he thought had been, was the most important in what was then just the burgeoning wine renaissance. And he said, and it absolutely blew me away. He said, Ernest and Giulio Gallo. And I was stunned because at that point they were making, you know, jug, not, well, not only jug wines, but, I you know, silver satin and, you know, yeah, any green springs and that kind of thing. And he said, if they can get people to stop, he said, they've got the money and they've got the, the ability to promote it. He said, if they can get people to stop drinking Pepsi Cola, I'll have them drinking. I'll have them drinking Cabernet in five years. And I thought. I thought that was really kind of interesting. Yeah. So Barbara, we got. We've got. Uh, yeah. Well, oh, these are like hard segues to follow. But welcome to the Union Hotel, everyone. I'm honored to. Uh, hopefully, I'm sounding okay. You're fine. All right. Honored to share this room with you. As I was listening to these stories, uh, first of all, I have to say I'm proud, part of the union, the soul of it is the generations, and Non is there, sitting to the right, and my daughter Jen, so you've got three generations working the crowd. Jen was on the keyboard, and uh, much of the soul that I love about the union is with Lucille Gomella, who's sitting yes. in front of the bar. Yeah, Lucille, so, Lucille. Love sharing. Yes, the yes, community. yes, there you go. And just hearing about Gallo, and just the wines following this little story. Fred McMurray of McMurray, my three sons would eat here all the time on Sunday nights and he would come in and I always thought Gallo was brilliant. If any of you have met Kate McMurray, she's amazing and just so gracious and Gallo was brilliant to go from the, maybe the jug wine image to, you know, having someone like Kate represent them and market. She's just a great face for them. So I'm always inspired by the McMurray family and Kate McMurray and uh, the fact that she loves the Union Hotel. So thank you all for being here. Well, I, you know, I think uh, one of the things that I want to know from you, uh, this is what, third generation, fourth generation? It's fourth generation. It's fourth generation, the same family now here. And, uh, you know, I remember when, <laughs> I, I remember too much, but I remember that when Mary, your, your, your grandmother-in-law, yes. uh, Mary Panacera, had a, a, a recipe, I, I read somewhere, that, or someone told me that Mary's recipe for zucchini fritters was in, and I don't remember whether it was in the Life Cookbook it's or it was in the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal, I that's right. That's, yeah, I think that there's a copy of it framed in. Yeah, the well, don't. I mean, I went looking for it because I loved those zucchini fritters, but it was recipe for a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always been a very busy place here, and I tell you, if you don't ever don't. I mean, I, I don't think you could find a place to park here on the, what, the weekends, like three weekends before Christmas, because everybody in the Bay Area comes up here to get their Christmas tree and have dinner at the Union Hotel. Um, you know, what do you think about, how do, how do you do this? How do you keep changing, and because obviously this is not Mary Panacera's restaurant. I mean, it is, but it isn't. Uh, you've, you, the family has, has made some changes. You, you've evo evolved, I believe is the word. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? You know, I, I, I believe, first of all, it's a lifestyle. You know, running a, a little a restaurant. It's a big restaurant. It's amazing. It's a, it's a daily way of life. So it's like when you order your vegetables from Joe and Wally, you're ordering, you know, 12 cases of Swiss chard. You know, it's not a boutique restaurant. It's quite, it's quite large and quite amazing. Um, thinking back to uh, just kind of going back to our history, Frank, my husband, uh, his family immigrated from Lake Como and bought this in 1925, Carlo Panacero, and then my great-grandfather, 
um, in Ocenti Elia, bought the Common Valley Ranch, which is on Common Valley Road. The school, it's still in the family where the little schoolhouse is, the ranch house. So both of our families immigrated here from Lake Como, and we still have both families still have houses on the lake. They're right up, you can kayak straight across the lake. So I think um, looking back, the struggles that they endured to get here and just to purchase this place, and uh, it's kind of like the legacy that we have to honor, and it's an honor to carry it on. Lucille, Mary Panizera was like the heart and soul of it and, and developed the zucchini fritter recipe for 100. And I love that Lucille nurtured it, and I am blessed to come. And uh, it's like passing of the torch, but I always feel like non, I still aspire to her wisdom. Um, I think one of my greatest joys is having the fourth generation on the keyboards at night or playing Waltz of the Flowers over the holiday season. Um, it's a journey, it's a, it's a daily lifestyle, but I was thinking about the restaurant in the old days, it started out with just chicken, duck, and steak, there were no menus, and it carried that way for, for almost two generations. Um, there was no Golden Gate Bridge, people ferried up on the train, it was a boarding house, um, and then it evolved into San Francisco firemen and uh, policemen all buying second homes up on uh, Mont Rio and Burnville. And so um, those families just started that generational pool that we're still so blessed to have today. There's four generations often at a table at the Union Hotel, at the Union Hotel and it just like, it's emotional for me to see that. And sometimes people are coming in on the last phase of their life, but it's so important for them to come back and just taste the flavors and feel the ambiance. And um, that's one of my greatest joys is to embrace that. Um, going back to the recipes being chicken, duck, and steak, you know, for two generations, and then transitioning to bringing in, uh, you know, just, we brought in pizza, we brought in, we have a great flatbread, I love our, people tell me our clam chowder is the best ever. Our chipino, as you know, is like, it's amazing. So I love that um, our foods are, I, I'm really proud of them, and I love how it's evolved. And most importantly, I think I love that you can come to the Union Hotel, have a candlelit dinner, and just have a bowl of soup. So it's affordable for everyone. It's like, it's not a luxury to go out to dinner. It's just a lifestyle that we embrace. So I'm really, really proud that um, just the same families come in and, and come back and continue to come back. But on a, just a, I'm just smiling about the last, this last week, to give you a, a glimpse of this week. We just wrapped our last wedding last night of 125, which was just bells and whistles and joy. And then we transitioned into creating a, a Thanksgiving dinner for Bob Burke's kids and just supporting that foundation. And that's, so we'll, we'll roast 12 large turkeys for the Bob Burke's foundation um, Thursday night. And then on Wednesday night, we have the young farmers of Marin and Sonoma County will have their annual dinner in this room. And then on Friday night, last Friday night, we had the cattle women of Marin and Sonoma County. So I love that all. Do they still call themselves the cowbells? The, the cattle women. Um, no, they were for their They're reservation as cattle women, but not like cowbells. Okay. Generational. It was so beautiful <laughs> to see them. It used to be. Yeah. But just, but just in the whole circle of the chicken, duck, and steak, one of my favorite dinners that was a party of forty. We did a long table last week, and it was the Kendall Jackson. All of the. Um, vineyard managers and from uh, the whole state and uh, guess what they wanted chicken duck and steak I and thought you I thought you were going to say beer <laughs> <laughs> and, and they sat at this table this long table straight in front right down here for for probably three hours so it was really a full circle uh, moment for me in life so proud to be here and um, proud to carry on thank you Jennifer, yeah. dare I say that you represent food culture? <laughs> we're doing yogurt here. Um, what what can you say? I mean, you 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 came in on I maybe the ground floor, maybe the barn floor. <laughs> I'm not sure, but but of this new farming that that which at the time you started was new and innovative. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that change and and uh, uh, what, from your perspective about what has happened with goat 
goat milk and goat cheese, and about you know I think you mentioned when when we we exchanged emails before that you know uh, all these specialty crops that you now have an you now have an olive uh, an olive orchard and a hop yard on your property. So let's let's talk about that. Okay, great. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Well, my parents moved our family here in 1964, um, and I was 10 years old, and uh, we moved to, then they even had abandoned apple orchards, and um, all of us kids um, got involved in 4-H, and um, the goats quickly became our favorites because they're really like dogs and their personality, and they can learn tricks, and they're small enough. Um, and so um, that added up to a herd quite quickly. <clears throat> and um, as we all have known, the 60s were really a time of change. Um, we just experienced the summer of love 50 year um, anniversary. And um, my parents in 1968 uh, started our original um, goat dairy, Redwood Hill Farm. and. Um, Basically, at that time, up until then, in the 50s, goat milk and goat products were looked at um, as more medicinal products. If you were allergic to cow dairy, if you had ulcers, you would use goat products. Um, but in the 60s, uh, things started changing because we now started getting these new stores, then they call them health food stores, and so it went from using goat products and, and Adele Davis for health to now a natural product and um, going back to the land, living off the land, people were, were getting goats and um, since my parents had started our dairy, uh, my mom and I would uh, deliver the uh, raw goat milk and glass bottles to the new health food stores uh, here in Sonoma County, organic grocery, uh, down to Berkeley um, and in the Marin County area. Um, so that really uh, got goat products going a little bit more, but I really credit the chefs for the um, uh, pr promotion of goat products and really putting them uh, on the map or on the menu because um, there was a new, then they called it California Cuisine, um, Alice Waters of Chez Panisse and our own uh, John Ash here in Sonoma County started using uh, goat cheese. More people were going to Europe, uh, cheese imports were coming here and they started serving goat cheese on uh, menus and when people pay a lot of money to go out to eat and they get served goat cheese, all of a sudden it's like, oh, goat cheese. <laughs> So um, that uh, really uh, got a lot of people and the chefs all started using it and I still find it um, really intriguing that um, the American Cheese Society, which is a national organization, recognizes the pioneers of goat cheese uh, primarily from Northern California. There was Laura Chanel who started in Santa Rosa and went to Sonoma. Uh, Mary Keene from Cypress Grove, who's in Arcata, and then um, us at Redwood Hill Farm. And so it was just kind of a, a grouping here that uh, really um, promoted and, and made fine goat cheeses that were similar to the European cheeses. Um, so that got people eating cheese, and then um, my husband and I took over our, uh, my parents' dairy in 1978, so next year will be 40 years for us. Um, and we really wanted to have a business um, so that, because even then, there was such a small percentage of people that would eat goat products that we had to not only have cheese, milk, we started making yogurt and kefir. And so um, it's become gratifying for me to see that um, people now, uh, I have children that are eating goat yogurt just because they think it tastes delicious. Um, the millennials are much more adventurous in their food, so uh, they're really uh, going for goat products in a big way. And we also have been diversifying our farms. Dairy goats are still 
uh, our main love, but we do have an olive orchard. Um, we have an abandoned apple orchard that we still sell the apples from, and, and then now the hop yard for the craft brewery. So uh, I think um, agriculture is alive and well in Snow County. Thank you. Good job. Jonah. Jonah, I wait you're writing a book down there, I can tell. You, you're, you're writing a book while, while we're talking. Uh, I'm I, writing my second book about uh, food and farming in Sonoma County yeah. because there's so much that's happened since I wrote my, my last book. Uh, I, I did want to say, uh, remind people of what probably most everybody here knows, but maybe at the, not at the top of your mind right now, is that is that people have been coming to this part of the world uh, for thousands of years, but they have not been coming here for the food and wine. The Native Americans who came like 25,000 years ago didn't come for the food and the wine. And the earliest uh, settlers who came from Mexico and Europe and, and the Yankees didn't come for the food and the wine either, but once they were here, they had to eat and, they, and drink, and so they I mean, they started to farm and, and to grow everything they needed and, and, and to make wine. Uh, the other, another point about history that I wanted to add is that while people have been coming here to farm for hundreds of years, they have also been leaving here because it's a very hard life. Um, uh, and they've gone other places, or that sometimes the sons and daughters of the farmers don't want to grow up and be, be farmers. When Jack London and his wife Charmian came to Sonoma County uh, in 1905, they, and they were part of something that was called the Back to the Land Movement, they found on Sonoma Mountain farms that had been abandoned by people who could not make it. I sometimes say to myself and to friends that, that I am personally to blame for the current uh, tourist invasion to our part of the world. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute here, Jonah. Give me, give me a little rope to hang myself. <laughs> yes, so in, in 2009, in the book of mine that you mentioned, Field Days, uh, the opening sentence reads, sooner or later, nearly everyone who cares about good wine and food comes to Sonoma and spreads the word of the spectacular food and wine around the world. And we were talking about this a, a month or so again, Gay, and I said I didn't think it was literally true at that time, but it has become literally true since then. So, <laughs> but I would say, <clears throat> shame on me. I should have been like Luther Burbank, who wrote to his mother in the 1870s to say, that, quote, Sonoma was the chosen spot of all the earth. That's the quotation. And then asked his mother, please do not repeat this information, because if you do, all the scuffs would come here and get drunk and curse the rest of the country. <laughs> so that's what's happened. All the scuffs have come here and they get drunk. And they curse, they curse Washington and every other place in the country. So, all, all the scuffs in the audience, will you raise your hand? <laughs> so I did have to look up scuffs. You know, it's not part of my ordinary vocabulary. You know, people who, uh, who uh, they just shuffle along. They don't lift their feet, uh, you know, when well, they I think, walk. Yeah, I think scuff so kind of speaks me. for itself. Um, <laughs> So um, I do feel a sense of nostalgia uh, for the 70s when I got here, when summer people went home after Labor Day. <laughs> and there was much less traffic on the roads than there was in July and August. But back in that day, you could go to all kinds of restaurants and eat really good food. Here or John Ashes, or Lisa Hemingway's, or De Schmier on the outskirts of Petaluma, or Ashe New, 
where you could eat really genuine French food. Um, I am a reluctant foodie. I spend too much time with food snobs. Um, I still eat in restaurants, but I enjoy eating in restaurants less than I once did and because I have learned that conditions in kitchens are often unhealthy, though dining rooms usually look immaculate. And, some, and though some of my dearest friends own restaurants, including Sandra Bernstein, Matthew Greenbaum, and Mark Dirkheising. This past week, I ate in restaurants three times. <laughs> well, four times if you include this. At Cafe La Haye, at Rosso, and at Crocodile, which calls itself a French restaurant, but doesn't seem to know the first thing about genuine French food. <laughs> but I ate there and at La Haye and Rosso to support local businesses in the wake of the fires, not because I wanted a gourmet meal. More and more, what's important to me is not where or what I eat, but who I eat with. I should add that in this in 2017, more Americans go to restaurants than ever before, and that there are more restaurants than ever before, because restaurants are now the places where people, Americans, celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, and weddings, and they don't do it at home. I'm uneasy about, or maybe unqueasy, about the America and the Sonoma, what I call, obsession with food. I'm obsessed too, but I can complain, maybe legitimately, that I have to be obsessed because I write about food. I've written restaurant reviews since the 1980s. I believe that it is next to cooking <laughs> or running the front of the house it's the hardest job in the world. You can't tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, though you can make approximations. If you do, the restaurant owners will complain, your editor will complain, the readers will complain, and you'll probably lose your job. <laughs> Jeff Cox almost lost his job when he wrote a review of, about Lagar that people still talk about. <laughs> Sometimes it seems to me that food and wine are the only things that people talk about around here. Uh, there must be some other subjects, but I can't really think about them, right, what they are right now. <laughs> I, I have had many a good meal here at the Union Hotel beginning in the 1970s when I lived five minutes away on Morelli Lane. And when I ate here, I felt that I was in the midst of regular people and not foodies, enjoying chicken cacciatore and those fritters <laughs> that don't seem to show up on menus all around the county. Why not? I'm also uneasy about the great number of people that I meet here who do not seem to know how to cook, what to cook, and who apparently need and want some kind of expert to tell them what to do. <laughs> I wish that my parents were still around. I wish I could drink the peach brandy that my mother made from the peaches my father grew or eat the venison that my father Joe, my father Sam got from his friend Joe, who was a hunter. My father gave him corn. I'm sorry I can't eat one of the apple pies that I made from the purloined apples in the orchard across the street from me on Morelli Lane that now, sadly, doesn't seem to have a single apple change. It's change, but I'm not sure it's progress. I believe that almost every time we move on, I think we lose something as well as gain something. 
Sometimes the losses might outweigh the gains. Still, the food world is endlessly fascinating. Yesterday, I learned about the Japanese women who massage by hand dried ripe persimmons, a luxury item, I'm told. I'm looking forward to eating one or two or more of them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, thank you. I just, just a question. When you cook for yourself and you're not out forced, when well, you're not forced into restaurants, forced, uh, yeah. Uh, what do you eat? Well, um, I grow some of my own vegetables. Uh, recently, I have been getting one of my mother's cast iron skillets and some olive oil, local olive oil, putting it in the skillet heating it up, thin slicing uh, garlic that I've grown, adding my Roma tomatoes that I've grown, and cooking them, and then making a small amount of pasta. I don't eat a half a pound of pasta, you know, myself anymore. It's over. <laughs> a small amount of pasta. You, you know, I don't rinse the pasta in cold water. I add it to the a dish that has the olive oil and the garlic and tomatoes, and that is fantastic. If you want to come to my, I'm inviting you, Gay, to my house, and I will make it for you. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Is that a deal? Sure. Okay. So one other thing, may I say? Certainly. I was born into a non-religious Jewish family. But my, all of my father's friends were Italians, and I wanted to be an Italian. <laughs> we, we all want to be Italian. Yeah. But you come to my house, and yeah, I'll make, yeah, I'll make you Portuguese yeah, soup. Okay. okay. Uh, Diane, you got to defend yourself down there now. I mean, you, the, Diane is, is our, our, our food writer for the Press Democrat, and. Uh, um, She's not, the, she's not a restaurant reviewer, I want, I want to quickly say that. Um, she's not the hired gun. She's not the hired gun, that's right. Uh, what do you think, of, bring us home, bring us to the present day of what the state of, of, you know, with the slow food movement now is, how old is the slow food movement, Jonah? But it goes back to the 70s? Uh, the, the 80s. 80s, Italy. in Sonoma Italy. Started here. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I got that part. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, so, well, I wrote this story back in, I think it was 2000, about it was like a, the history of wine country cuisine, and it talked about how it was all about the authenticity and the simplicity of the ingredients. And I think we are still um, working on that. It's, it's sort of as in all art, it's the simplicity is the hardest thing to get to, and and uh, and but but we, as Americans, we found our own voice. We realized we don't have to be French, we don't have to be Italian. We can take our influences here, which are mainly the beautiful uh, cuisines of of Asia, which are you know some of our most ancient cuisines, and then the wonderful flavors of Mexico and the chefs are integrating those into their foods and coming up with a whole new genre that is, uh, you know, original, American original, just like the cheeses. You know, all the cheeses here may be based on a European cheese, but they're made with, with California milk and it's, it's a different terroir, just like the wine has a different terroir. So, and the wine, it was a big part of the food. I mean, wine is a food. That's what I always say. You know, it, it's part of the meal, and um, it, it kind of makes the meal, really. Anything else to add from all of this that you've heard? Uh, well, I just had a little story because I, I've had a lot of disasters this year, but. For some reason, I got talked into going to the Bahamas the week Irma was coming, and <laughs> it was by my best friend. We're we're uh, she lives on the uh, in South Carolina now. I don't get to see her. Her whole family was going, 
And I was covering that day, I was covering the taste of Sonoma. If anybody went there, it was 108 degrees. And then we were supposed to leave, and I, at four o'clock I said, okay, I'm not going, because you know, I knew about the hurricane coming. And then she, she said, well, we have an escape plan, and we, we have this plane chartered, and they're, we're gonna, they're gonna get us out of there. I said, well, okay, what are we cooking? <laughs> and she goes, okay, here's the list. Like, we're gonna get to Nassau, and we're going to the grocery store, and, and this is what we're gonna make. <laughs> And that was really the thing that got me through that because as my husband will attest, even when I got to Atlanta, I was ready to back out. You know, I was very nervous, but um, you know, for me, I, I really, a lot of my friends do cook and, and pretty much, I, I mean, you get to a certain point, you can kind of cook as well as you could eat at a restaurant. So what's the point, you know? Just have some people over and cook and that's, you know, uh, I think that's the nice part about living in Sonoma County is so many people do cook and do grow their own food and you know or like me they know someone who does it really well and they you know get a CSA or something you know because <laughs> I mean it is a it, it's a lot of um, work to grow food. Some people out there may not know what a CSA is. Oh, um, oh that's true. It's a uh, it's like a subscription to a farm, so I subscribe to Tierra Vegetables, and every week I go to the farm and I pick up, I get to see the farm, and you know, it's a very nurturing kind of environment to see food being grown right there, and you can, if you don't want, if you don't need another cabbage, you can get something else, and but uh, they are very dedicated farmers, and they've been doing it for longer than I've been writing, and I've been writing in Selma County since 1982, so they've been at it since the 70s. So, If you don't want to grow your own food, just just you know go to the farmer's market or... But the audience 